years ago, before you were born, even before your grandparents were born, maybe when your great-great-grandparents were born, the greedy people in a faraway land <coughs> devised a new plan for making money. Of course. The people of this land were crazed by money and tried everything to get richer and richer. They had gone around the whole world, taking everything they could find and selling it. Often, they even sold things they had stolen back to the people they had taken them from. So shameless were these people that they even stole people and sold them, shipping them across the sea and selling them like animals to work in the fields and the factories. Yes? That's, un that's untrue. That's terrible. They kept inventing new things to sell and made machines that could make things faster and faster so that every day there was more to sell. These machines were hungry and had to be fed all the time. So the people of this land had to look further and further for the materials to feed this machine. Ang, 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 ang. They were hungry. They spread all over the world, invading many countries, taking what they could find, and they would force the people who lived there to work for them to take more supplies for their devouring machines. But our story, though, is about a new way of making money that they invented. These people had realized that some kinds of knowledge were useful for making money, especially the technical knowledge that that could be used for making new machines and new things to sell. So, they became great scientists with knowledge of all the material things in the world. And although they neglected the wisdom of other matters of life, their scientific knowledge brought them great power and wealth, riches and splendor. But even then, they were not content. So some of them devised a plan to make money out of understanding people. Now, every culture has its own way of understanding people and its wisdoms about human matters. <coughs> oh, yes. But these people wanted a different kind of knowledge. Did you know that? Okay. I know that. They had but wise elders me. with knowledge of <gasps> philosophy and religion. Oh, yes. But they wanted their knowledge of people to be like their scientific knowledge. This knowledge should not just be the wisdom of their culture based on everyday truths observed by people in their daily lives or the results of debates amongst the wisest of them. Oh no, it should instead be based on experiments of scientists, like their knowledge of machines and material things in which they had already excelled. It should not just bring them sympathetic ways of understanding people, but rather technical and scientific ways of understanding how to change people. They realized that if they could tell those in charge of factories how to make the people who work for them work harder and more efficiently, and those in charge of countries how to make their citizens more obedient and productive, their knowledge will be worth a lot of money. So, they grouped together, let's group, and invented a new profession, which they called psychology. Now, all of this took place in Europe and the United States of America about 100 years ago. This new profession of psychology quickly became powerful, especially in the United States, where industry was growing at a rapid rate and the new techniques for making workers more productive was very popular with the bosses. But the real success of this psychology came with the outbreak of fighting between some of these countries. We must remember that these people were not only insatiably greedy, but inclined to great violence. And just when it seemed that they had finished conquering all the countries in the world, they turned on each other, huh? believing as they did that they were the center of the world. Bible. They called this terrible outbreak of white-on-white -white violence 
the First World War. In this war, the American army recruited many thousands of new soldiers and then had to work out how to fit each person into a job that they could do properly. Oh, this was very difficult as these Americans were mainly an uneducated bunch, many of whom could not even read or write, and some who hardly spoke English. But here, the new psychologists showed themselves to be very useful. Taking the idea from IQ testing, which had already been developed for placing learners in different classes, they made tests for assessing people and streaming them according to their skills and abilities, mm -hmm. and thus helped assign the new troops into suitable positions. It soon became very clear that this skill could be just as useful in the workplace. And thus, out of this testing, the field of industrial psychology was born. For the psychologists who had been dealing with emotionally disturbed people, the war was also good for business and they had many victims of shell shock who they could now treat and use to develop their treatments. These years were so important for the American psychologists that by the end of it, they could proudly announce that... As we've put more psychology into this war than any other nation, and as we have more laboratories and more men than all others, we should henceforth lead the world in psychology. The future of the world, in a peculiar sense, depends upon American psychologists. As psychology grew from strength to strength, it had to show how it was different from other professional approaches to studying people. Just as it had claimed to be better than philosophy because it used experimental methods, psychology also tried to make itself separate from other areas of studies like anthropology, sociology and politics by studying individuals on their own rather than groups of people. This concern with the individual fitted very well with the culture of the Europeans and Americans who were a selfish and uncaring people with little sense of community. Their greedy and aggressive nature made them compete against each other to try to be richer and have more possessions. And those that were very successful in this striving liked the psychological approach most of all. Do you know why? Because it told them that they were successful because they had greater abilities and higher intelligence. You know, this let them ignore the fact that the rich almost always started out with wealth and privileges. And how the poor were poor not because of laziness or stupidity, as the rich often thought, but because the society did not offer them the same opportunities that the wealthy were given. So, psychology carried on ignoring the problems in the culture and instead looked for problems in each individual. Psychology became powerful as it always had friends amongst the privileged and the wealthy and in each country the psychologists formed professional societies so that they could control who became psychologists and how much they would get paid. Psychology grew to have large departments in the universities with a multitude of researchers publishing in many, many different academic journals and developed specialized knowledge and training in several professional areas such as clinical, educational and industrial psychology. Only a privileged few could complete these training programs with the hope of lucrative careers ahead of them. But because psychology was concerned only with studying individuals, a problem remained. Hmm. It is obvious to us that people live in a social world, but the psychologists, having cut themselves off from the rest of the social sciences, did not know how to think about this properly. This was a common mistake in their culture, and the greatest philosophers had said, I think, therefore I am not realizing, as we all do, that we do not exist in our thoughts, but in our culture and in our relationships with each other and those around us. 
psychologists had turned this mistake into a profession and now had to think of a way of solving the problems it had created. So, in their discipline, the psychologists invented a small area called social psychology to investigate how social groups influence individuals. They avoided questions about how cultures and societies work and concentrated instead on studying small groups of people. Now, because they wanted to seem scientific, they devised experiments to examine how people would behave in different situations. Although they did many thousands and thousands of different experiments, nobody really seemed very interested in the results. And it was only after the next major outbreak of white-on-white -white violence, and this time, do you know that they called it World War II, that things started getting very interesting. This long and brutal war left the Europeans and Americans in a state of shock. Finally, they realized that the science and technology that they had believed would solve all their problems could also be used destructively, and that the brutal methods that they had developed for conquering other parts of the world could just as easily be used at home. They were especially shocked by the concentration camps, realizing with horror that they could treat each other the way they had previously treated other races. And they were also shocked by the atomic bomb, which gave them the ability to destroy each other completely. Finally, the social psychologists became interested in why they could inflict so much harm on each other and why violence was so common in their societies. Yazi, they designed new experiments to investigate these problems, several of which became quite famous because of their disturbing results. Ozan Gintele. One such experiment was done by Stanley Milgram, in which he asked people to take part in a study of punishment and learning. Yay! The participants were told to give stronger and stronger shocks to the learners every time they made a mistake remembering the words. Milgram really wanted to see how severely the participants would shock the learners before refusing to carry on with the punishment. Most of the people he asked beforehand thought that the participants would not give very strong shocks at all, but in actual fact, most of them carried on making the shocks stronger and stronger and stronger until they were extremely dangerous and potentially lethal. Manjanage, another psychologist called Zimbardo, did a study of how people's behavior is affected by the social roles in which they find themselves. Now, he got students from Stanford University to set up a mock prison where some of them played the parts of prisoners and the others played the parts of the guards. The participants started acting as if their parts were real. And after a few days, Zimbardo had to stop the whole study because the guards were becoming increasingly abusive to the prisoners who had quickly become very scared and depressed. 40. In another famous study, Sharif took some young boys to a holiday camp to study the ways in which conflict between groups developed. The boys were divided into two groups who competed for prizes in various games and activities. Now he found that the boys from the different groups became increasingly hostile to each other. Yeah, this hostility carried on even though they were not competing with each other anymore. And it was very difficult to find ways of reducing this conflict once it had started. Now. You might think that these disturbing findings made the social psychologists start worrying about the consequences of their culture, built as it was on ruthless competitiveness and exploitation. Hey, my me. This was not the case. Because they did not know how to think about culture and society, they just assumed that they had discovered the universal laws of human nature, which applied to people everywhere. Hey, yes. They believed that all people would behave in the destructive manner that they had seen in their experiments. 
They never thought about the fact that almost all their studies were conducted on middle class white American men, and usually university students at that. But soon afterwards, some voices of discontent started to be heard in American society. Black Americans and women had grown angry that they did not have all the civil rights that America so proudly claimed for its citizens. The official discrimination against women and blacks was challenged. Yay! And gradually, they managed to take up professional and academic positions. We as the, the white men who had always run psychology were faced with criticism about the way they had assumed that their limited perspectives could explain all of human existence. <laughs> At the same time, there was a bit of a squabble going on between American and European psychologists. The Americans had always been greatly impressed with the advances of physical sciences and had thought that the only way for psychology to become respected was to use the methods of the physical sciences as a guideline for their work. <laughs> that is to say, that they should at all times use experimental methods in their research. Now, the European psychologists argued that there were two problems with this belief. An experiment relies on results that you can see and measure, which is a problem when you're trying to understand people, because you can't measure their thoughts and feelings, eh? Hi, boy. <laughs> so all you can study is their behavior. And it was argued that restricting yourself to examining behavior without being allowed to talk about people's experiences meant that you're missing the whole point of psychology. <laughs> Secondly, the Europeans argued that people need to be understood in the social environment in which they exist, not just as isolated individuals in artificial laboratory settings. Uh -uh. They were more influenced by ideas of the social sciences, like sociology and anthropology, than by the physical sciences. Mm -hmm. So the European social psychologists wanted to study people in real-life situations and to speak to them about their own experiences. The European social psychologists wanted to find out more about the way people think and were more willing to pay attention to the influence of culture and society in these matters. They said it was more important to study things like language and ideology. Way to find out how society shaped the way people think. We as they showed that the way in which people think about themselves and the world they live in was greatly influenced by culture and society in which they live. Now these findings were very interesting. But the European social psychologists kept trying to justify their work by getting caught up in complicated philosophical arguments about language and the nature of reality. And so most of the time, people didn't really understand what they were talking about. <laughs> in any case, the American social psychologists were not very concerned with these arguments. Although they also wanted to make their work relevant for current social issues, Nobody really paid much attention to them, and so they had to get on with the business of making money. <laughs> All that was left for them to do was design more and more experiments and to publish them in academic journals, which nobody really read. <laughs> but at least it's helped them to get jobs in universities, eh? Teaching learners about all these experiments that they had conducted. Some of them even wrote big textbooks. Ooh, Lord! with glossy pages and pictures telling about all the things that they had done and found. You know, they sold these textbooks all over the world. Yeah, bo, even here, where university lecturers prescribe them for students of psychology. Yes, if you look around, you are sure to see them. So, now when you see learners weighed down with big books on social psychology, looking very confused by all these strange ideas, hey, you can explain to them where these things came from and tell them our story about how the social psychologist got his facts. <laughs>